Is there an echo in here? Not anymore, and we'll tell you why this week on Motoring 2006. TSN Motoring 2006 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. A visit to Europe can be a frustrating experience if you're a car nut. Why? Well, because over there, there are so many small, cool cars with great designs, the cars we never get to see here in North America for all sorts of reasons. One, of course, is safety legislation. The other, hey, let's face it, North Americans are not into small cars. The bigger, the better. But you may have noticed fuel prices are on the rise and consumers here are starting to think maybe small is where it's at. And manufacturers are beginning to see an expanding segment. I mean, look at Mercedes. They started bringing in the smart car and it sold well in Canada. Well, now Toyota is getting into the act. The Yaris has always been a big hit in Europe and it's now coming to North America at the expense of the Echo. The reason? Well, one word and it's Japanese, Kaizen. What does Kaizen mean and why is Toyota abandoning the popular Echo? Well, this week we're in Vancouver to find out. Yaris was introduced in its first generation, really is the car that was going to help launch Toyota properly into the European marketplace. And uh, in that first generation, it became Car of the Year in Europe, and, uh, and known as the Vitz, it was also Car of the Year in Japan. But at that point, we uh, were going in a different direction in North America. We brought out the Echo Sedan, and later, the Echo Hatchback. Uh, that vehicle has gone on to help us take uh, typically about 40% of the subcompact marketplace in Canada. It's been a great success for us and actually paved the way for, uh, for a broader rollout of hatchbacks here in North America. A lot of people have said, look, when you, when you have uh, the reigning share of the subcompact market, you're throwing out that brand equity, why are you doing it? Well, the answer is that as, as good as it is to have that brand equity, uh, people have come to know what ECHO is all about, what it stands for. This car is bigger, bolder, better in every respect, and we want them to understand that Yaris has something new and different to offer in this segment. Yaris features a brand new, completely redesigned platform uh, with amazing increased uh, torsional rigidity, uh, a new front suspension, and a brand new, completely redesigned rear suspension. Yaris will be available in Canada in uh, two version, uh, two door, uh, hatchback, which we call a three-door, and also a five-door hatchback. Yaris will uh, be available in one engine, which is the 1NZFE engine. It's a 1.5 liter dual overhead camshaft, 16 valve, uh, with variable valve timing with intelligence. What I like to see a Toyota do is, is stay true to the core values of you know, making a small, fuel-efficient vehicle that has good packaging, decent styling, and, and decent ride dynamics. Ignoring uh, that kind of marketplace, which has been typical of North American manufacturers, that really, really inexpensive entry-level place, uh, not ignoring that is a smart move by Toyota. They paid attention to a group of buyers who um, don't have a lot of money, but could one day have a lot of money, and they'll grow into more expensive Lexus vehicles. I was a little surprised at how much better than Echo that it is, because Echo is a pretty decent little car, and this one looks good, feels good, got a good high level of content and decent price. It's all about Kaizen. We've talked about it lots of times, and Kaizen means continuous improvement. Uh, Look for all of those small ways in which you can uh, which you can better your performance day to day. But above and beyond all of that, what it's going to do is we hope make small cars aspirational again. We're used to expensive gas in Canada, so Canadian buyers have already been buying these cars in mass. I mean, Toyota's been selling 31,000 of these a year, uh, combined Echoes and Echo hatchbacks. 
But with the Americans now finally becoming really aware of their vulnerability to high fuel costs, that's going to be good for Canada because if the Americans buy them, we get more choice too. We understand that uh, in other markets, in Europe in particular, subcompacts are, are cool, they're, uh, they're urban. That's what we're trying to launch here in Canada. I wonder if you could run a car on coffee. What's my point? Well, later I might actually have one on Kenzie's Corner. I'm driving a Porsche and you're not, okay? It doesn't matter how bad I look. It doesn't matter how bad I look. I'm driving a Porsche and you're not. For years, Jeep's only mainstay product has been the Grand Cherokee. Well, for 2006, that all changes with this all-new Commander. Not only does this thing get a Hemi, it's also the first vehicle in Jeep history to accommodate seven. While the Commander is about the same size as the Grand Cherokee, it's a very different vehicle. To begin with, its slab-sided nature harks back to an earlier time, that of the original Cherokee and its predecessor, the Wagoneer. This, however, is not to say the style is old-fashioned. Many, including she who must be obeyed, preferred the look to other Jeeps. Raising the roof by a little over three inches then gives the interior room needed to accommodate three rows of seats, each of which sits a little higher than the row ahead. This so-called theatre seating means those relegated to the third row will they still have some semblance of a view. When it comes to utility, well, this Commander's got the lot. However, it is an either-or proposition. You either carry a lot of cargo, 68.9 cubic feet of it with the seats folded flat, or you carry seven passengers. Because when you pull the third row up out of the floor, which is a very easy thing to do, you end up with very little cargo space. Having said that, this has got one of the better third row seats in the segment. Naturally, being a Jeep means a sophisticated all-wheel drive system. The base unit drives all four wheels all the time, but does not offer the low-range gear set needed to go off-road. Move up to the Quadratrack 2 transfer case adds that missing ingredient. However, for those that want the real McCoy, well, you'll have to opt for the Quadradrive system. This thing gets all the bells and whistles, as well as electronic limited slip differentials in the front and rear axles, as well as the central transfer case. When so equipped, the Commander is all but impossible to get stuck. Trust me, I tried to no avail. When you've finished your off-road foray, getting into the on-road mode is very simple. Simply select neutral, hold this up until the four low light stops flashing, you're then ready for some on-roading. Power for the Commander comes from a number of engines. A 3.7 litre V6 that has just enough, a 4.7 litre V8 that's got plenty, and a 5.7 litre Hemi. The latter really is the only way to go as it delivers a class leading towing capacity of 7,200 pounds. Mind you, expect to dig deep to keep the tank topped off. It also means the Commander will run to 100 kilometers an hour in seven seconds and blast between the 80 and 120 marks in an equally impressive 6.3 seconds. Obviously having 330 horsepower and 375 pound-feet of torque helps, but so does the five-speed automatic. First is low enough to take advantage of the power, while fifth delivers comfortable highway cruising. As you've come to expect from Jeep, you can load this Commander to the absolute nines. Everything from full leather to a nav system to an in-car entertainment system that uses wireless headphones. But more importantly, they've addressed an age-old dilemma, the problem of what to do with a shorter driver. In this case, not a problem. Fully articulated seat, tilt steering and power adjustable pedals means that even my five foot three inch daughter is safe when she's driving this vehicle and primarily because she can sit far enough away from the airbag. Along with that all wheel drive system comes an electronic stability control system and a very good set of anti-lock brakes. Now these things are strong enough to haul the commander to rest from 100 kilometers an hour in 37.5 meters. And even after repeated stops, the pedal remains crisp and its action free from fade. 
You know, when all's said and done, this new Commander is a very likeable tool. It's comfortable, it's accommodating, and it's got plenty of power thanks to that Hemi engine. Its most likeable trait, however, is its all-wheel drive system. Not only is it very good when you go boonie bashing, it works equally well on road, and that's because it's layered with sophisticated electronics. This thing even knows if you're about to roll over and takes corrective action. The bottom line, when it's rainy and damp and slippery like this, or worse still, when the snow flies, you're going to get where you're going safely. Mosport, probably Canada's most famous racetrack, and we're doing a press event today for all of our new open top sports cars. The Boxster Boxster S, 911 Carrera Cabriolet, 911 Carrera S Cabriolet, and the Carrera GT. Gives the journalists here the opportunity to experience all five of these cars in what we call their performance personalities. Four hundred and forty thousand dollars, but I am a dealer, so you say come see me. Yeah. I've had a, such a long association with Porsche; it goes oh, close to forty years now. And in that forty-year time, I've seen Porsche come up through the ranks of, of having a car that was basically class-winning cars in racing, all the way up to having cars that are built uh, have the ability to win Le Mans and Daytona and, and races overall. So. Along with that racing tradition has gone a tremendous development on the street side of the cars. Porsche is now making what I think is, are the finest sports cars that they've ever made. And when you look at the Boxster, and then as you go through the Boxster lineup, you go through the 911 lineup, whether you're going to buy just a regular Carrera, whether you want to get something really special and get the Carrera S, whether you want to have a coupe or a Cabriolet, they just make every car that is, is uh, you know, sort of stirs the energy in the soul. It's nice to be able to bring all these journalists together and for them to experience the differences between the, the slowest car, which is the Boxster, which is by no means slow, to the, the King Kong daddy of them all, the Carrera GT, and see the expressions on their faces as they drive all these cars. The Carrera GT, that was my my goal today and I had the chance to drive the car this morning. I know I had the chance to drove something that is worth approximately six hundred thousand uh, dollars. Lucky for us we are sharing the car with an instructor and so I had a good instructor on the passenger seat and he gave me advices and I definitely needed them because I just was nervous driving such a car. You know, when they get in the Carrera GT, they're kind of, you know, all kind of nervous and, and uh, they they don't really know what to expect. And they come away with going, you know, this is not such a bad car to drive. This is actually easy to, car to drive. And in comparison to the other supercars that are on the market, the Carrera GT is a very, very drivable car. It can be trapped in rush hour traffic in downtown cities and not complain. And a lot of the other kind of supercars would, would never put up with that kind of, of business. And then it can get onto a racetrack and go like a race car. To have the company to take the trouble to put so much money on the same track and to tell us, go ahead, have some fun, make sure that you can push the car to the limit. That is the beauty of the experience. I can buy a Porsche, I'll drive it on Bay Street, downtown Toronto, but I cannot really experience the car itself. And any Porsche buyer, to make sure that if you spend that amount of money, you can learn how to take all the best from one of the best cars in the world. The 
2006 Dodge Charger has actually been engineered to be a huge model box. Toy model box, toy kit car. So anyway, what we're about to do right now is put this car together in less than six minutes, you can count it. Well, we're here downtown Toronto. Uh, we're here uh, in one of the different events that we've had scheduled throughout Canada. Uh, we've had a stop already in Edmonton and Calgary and a few different stops in the United States as well. Okay, let's get this all lined up. Now a little Corey F. Grand jump. All right. Well, we're building the car. It takes about roughly eight minutes to build the car. It's uh, sectioned off uh, uh, from door panels to hoods to engine covers to wheels. and. Um, it essentially allows uh, us to showcase the car, build it in, in different steps, uh, and also talk about some of the different features in, in a handheld way. And the cool thing about the 2006 Dodge Charger this year, all of the acoustic is Boston Acoustic Sound System. It's obviously attracting a lot of people. They're coming down. Uh, they're getting to see exactly what the car is about in a little bit of a spectacle. And, course, and it just allows people in an unconventional setting to actually see the car and experience the car. I mean, you can see right here we're uh, in the financial district in, uh, at Bay and King, and uh, you don't necessarily see these different types of things happening in terms of uh, product displays, let alone a, a car build display. Power tools. <laughs> it's, it's captivating a lot of people. It's bringing them in, and uh, we're having fun today doing see? it. The car actually does start. Peace out. Recently, we were at the launch of the Kia Rio, a vehicle that comes equipped with disc brakes on the front and drum brakes on the back. Well, this had a lot of automotive journalists in a state of shock. In fact, they were quite upset. They felt that disc brakes should be on all four wheels. Well, the Toyota Yaris that we're looking at this week also comes with drum brakes on the rear. So, who is right? Well, let's put that question to our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Brad, as an auto mechanic, you'd like nothing better than having all your customers driving vehicles with four-wheel disc brake systems. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the drum brakes on the back of the Yaris and the Kia Rio. Those little grocery getters don't need a lot of stopping capability. Not a lot of weight, not a lot of power, not a lot of speed capability. They're not hard on brakes. Drums are just fine. They're cheap, they're simple, they light, and they work forever. And they're easy to fix, and they don't seize up. Disc brake systems, oh. If you're living in Atlantic Canada, Quebec, or anywhere around the Great Lakes, they're a mess all the time. The rotors are wrecked, the calipers are seized up, the pads are locked in their keyways with rust. They're an absolute mess. Disc brakes work great on the front axle of vehicles. They don't work well in the back because the rear axle runs in all that billowing muck and salt spray that comes off the front when you're driving in the wintertime. Seized up in no time. Now, uh, disc brake systems are a distinct advantage on high performance vehicles or high end cars, sometimes on really heavy vehicles because they cool better on repeated hard stops. However, here's a perfect example of a vehicle that's heavy, a pickup truck, lots of weight that could be carried in the back of this vehicle, 7,000 pound tow capacity on this vehicle, and they're stopping it just fine with drum brakes as long as they're sized correctly. And an interesting thing in the Dodge press release, this is our 05 Dakota long-term tester. I noticed in the press release they talked about a 15-pound weight saving they had made on this vehicle by going with a drum brake system on the rear versus a comparable vehicle with a four-wheel disc brake system of comparable stopping power weighed 15 pounds more. Now you might think 15 pounds is just a drop in the ocean when you're talking about a heavy vehicle like a pickup truck, and it probably is, but that's 15 pounds of unsprung weight. What is unsprung weight? Well, it's everything in your vehicle suspension like the wheel and tire, like the whole rear axle on this pickup truck that doesn't receive the benefit of the springs and shocks. In other words, it's mass that's flying up and down as you go over bumps. Now, if you take 15 pounds of unsprung weight out of that vehicle, it's fairly significant in terms of handling and performance and ride because it's 15 pounds less that those springs and shocks have to control. The vehicle's just that much more nimble. For example, on a pickup truck, it'll make a difference when you're cornering on a washboard road. You know, the old pickups used to really skip out at the back end. 
these newer ones like this Dodge are less prone to doing that and it's thanks to things like reduction in unsprung weight. Also wheel and tire packages over the years have taken a lot of unsprung weight out of vehicles by going to aluminum wheels. Even though they've gone with bigger wheels and tires, they've kept the weight down by going to aluminum alloy wheels. So reducing the unsprung weight in a significant amount, like 15 pounds, is certainly worth the effort. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2006. Recently, the price of gasoline has skyrocketed. Everybody's tearing their hair out. The fuel prices are high. It's going to break my budget. I got to sell my big car and get something small, blah, blah, blah. But you know, it ain't that big a deal. First of all, do the math. If you include inflation, the price of gasoline is probably lower now than it was 30 years ago. Not only that, gasoline is just about the cheapest thing you can buy at your local service station. I mean, you look at the price of water, Coca Cola, antifreeze, even that little jar of whiteout that you can buy there, those things are way more expensive than gasoline. In fact, gasoline is about the best bargain you've got going for you. And the other thing to look at is the overall cost of running your car. Compared to the cost of capital and particularly depreciation, gasoline is just about irrelevant. I mean, if you bought a car that got 10 miles per gallon better fuel economy than the one you've got now, at the end of the year, you might have saved enough money, I don't know, for one Starbucks latte. That'll be venti extra hot 1% milk. Thank you very much. So it isn't that big a deal. Now I'm all in favor of small cars. I love small cars myself. I like the idea that we can reduce the use of fossil fuels to try and improve the environment and reduce our dependence on foreign oil. But you know what? Don't beat yourself up over it. I'm Jim Kenzie. Few final thoughts in the 2006 Toyota Yaris. Three words. It's about time. As I said off the top of the program, manufacturers have had all sorts of reasons for not bringing in those European cars where small is still hip. And of course, gas prices are going up in North America, but you know, North Americans still do not want to drive in a Conobox. Companies like Mazda have already learned that. And maybe now with the Yaris and the smart car, we'll see more European design coming to North America. So while we don't like the high gas prices, maybe after all there is a silver lining. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. They have this smart sort of cruise control now that slows you down when you, when you come up to, behind the car. I wouldn't want to be first with this technology. It's great technology. I love the science. I fear the lawyers. TSN's Motoring 2006 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses.